So I want to <coughs> just take a little bit of time to relate the material you look through in terms of the rock cycle, um, different kinds of rocks and, and how they are transformed one to another that we know of you know, from geological studies on Earth and relate that to the handful of landing sites we've actually visited uh, on Mars. So, I mean, if you had any kind of earth science class in high school, you're probably familiar with the rock cycle. Right? Uh, three major classes of rocks, and what are they? Well, they're actually up there. We've got uh, igneous rock, and sedimentary rock, and metamorphic rock. So uh, igneous rock is probably a great place to start the rock cycle. What are we talking about when we're talking about igneous rocks? Yeah, so these were rocks that are formed directly from magma. So you've got molten material rocks that have been completely melted uh, through these, you know, underground processes involving the mantle in the upper part of the crust, and that magma uh, when it cools down enough, it's going to form rocks. Okay. You melt something by heating it up, let it cool off, and it's going to solidify again. Um, and that Solidification can either occur above ground, if we've got a volcano that is actually spewing lava out or uh, throwing ash up into the air, but um, molten magma can also, if it just hangs around underground and gradually cools off, can also uh, create igneous rocks that are formed in these below ground chambers. So then, what are we talking about when we're talking about sedimentary rock? Sand and like other stones and pebbles like brush together. Yeah. Okay. So when any kind of rock weathers, you can get all sorts of materials that are being eroded off. Sand grains, silt, uh, various chemicals. Um, to produce a sedimentary rock, you have to have not only the weathering and erosion that produces the sediments over here, and sedi those sediments can come from igneous rock, they can come from other kinds of sedimentary rocks that get eroded, they can come from metamorphic rocks. Basically, any rock that is, that's exposed can become eroded, can give off sediments, those sediments can accumulate, but just an accumulation of sediments does not make a rock. I mean, if you go to the beach, what do you have when you're walking along the beach? You've got sediments. You've got sand there on the beach. That is, not that is not by itself a rock. So that sediment, whether it's you know, a layer of sand along the beach, whether it is fine mud and other silty material that's accumulated in a shallow lake basin or shallow sea, those sediments have to be fused together then to form a, a sedimentary rock. And so that's what is being shown uh, and this process of you know, taking those loose sediments, compacting them, cementing them together, forming various kinds of sedimentary rocks like sandstone and um, siltstone, mudstone, okay. sand, stone, basically accumulation of sand that's been compacted and cemented together to form rock. Um, mudstone, same kind of thing. Uh, metamorphic rocks probably a little bit uh, um, more obscure. If you take if you take these rocks and recycle them down into the earth and they get hot enough, they're going to melt, right? 
And if you get magma and magma cools, what kind of rock do you get? Igneous. We've already talked about that. Okay. So metamorphic is kind of this, uh, an in-between situation where you get rocks exposed to high enough temperature and high enough pressure that they become altered. So um, uh, limestone, for example, which is a sedimentary rock, if you expose it to heat and pressure, can become marble. Okay. Marble is, you know, kind of related to the, the limestone, the calcium carbonate, but it's been altered by the high temperatures and pressures. Uh, and changes the crystalline structure of the rock, and we get new kinds of rocks forming. Um, actually, in this area, we have lots of metamorphic rocks, um, given all of the um, plate collisions that have taken place in uh, eastern New York State, and Connecticut, and New England. Basically, it's been... Um, bumper cars between various kinds of plates for the last billion years, pushing rocks together, heating them up, putting them under pressure, and so we have a lot of we have a lot of marble. We also have a lot of gneiss, which is uh, G N E I S S. So a lot of the banded formations of rock you see along here along the road cuts are these highly metamorphized rocks, um, nice schist, marbles, things like that. Okay. So this, this, is, this is the understanding of how rocks uh, cycle through this rock cycle that's been built up uh, based on our understanding of these geological processes on Earth. Just want to quickly throw this image up. This is... Uh, um, this specifically deals with the different kinds of um, igneous rocks. And actually, let's just leave it at that. Uh, just so you've got this, this image in the presentation, you can refer to it later. We'll be talking about this a lot more next Monday when we're doing the igneous rock density lab. Okay, so um, <coughs> how can we relate this to Mars? So we have landed landers, okay, the Viking one and two landers in 76, Pathfinder in 97, uh, Opportunity which is still going, and Spirit, which uh, uh, had terminated um, several years back, you know, Opportunity in Meridiani Planum, and Spirit in uh, Gusev Crater. We've uh, had a stationary lander, the Phoenix mission, up here, up toward the northern polar cap. And uh, this particular map was labeled before the actual landing of the Mars Science Laboratory mission, but Curiosity is here, over here in Gale Crater. So we've actually been on the surface in just a handful of spots on Mars. But I do want to take a few minutes to talk about how those sites do relate back to um, the different kinds of rocks that we can identify from the rock cycle. Okay. <coughs> So, uh, Viking 1 landing site in uh, Chrysi Planitia, up here. The uh, Viking landing site is actually uh, on the southern uh, edge of Chrysi Planitia. Um, Aris Vallis, where, uh, Aries Vallis, where Pathfinder came down, is actually not that far away. I think it's this one. Uh, again... Um, an outflow plane. So if you take a look at the site, you what do you see? What do you see in this picture from Viking 1? <coughs> yeah. 
Yeah. See a lot of rocks. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, That's what I was going to say myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, this is the Viking One landing site. You can see um, there's a fair amount of, of cobble-sized rocks. Uh, I mean, when they landed the Viking 1 and 2 landers, they actually didn't have very good images from orbit as to how rough the terrain was going to be. And these landers were not real smart. I mean, this is 1976 computers um, um, driving them down. Uh, so actually, when Viking 1 and 2 went into orbit, they had preliminary picked out, they, they had initially picked out landing sites um, based on Mariner 9 images. They thought, okay, we'll send Viking 1 down here, and we'll send Viking 2 down here. And when they got to orbit, the Viking orbiters, which we don't think of because so much attention is focused on the landers, had much better cameras than the, Vi than the Mariner 9 cameras. And they started getting images from orbit, better images from orbit of where they were planning to send Viking 1 and Viking 2 down. And they said, oh, wait a minute. Uh, we do not want to send these uh, landers down there. So um, Viking 1 was actually scheduled to land on July 4th, 1976, which would have been the bicentennial of uh, the United States. Um, but they missed that landing date because they had to quick scramble to find a better place and they eventually chose uh, Chrysi Planitia here. Came down instead on July 20th, which uh, was also an anniversary. What big event in space history happened on July 20th? <coughs> the first moon landing, Apollo 11, um, July 20th, 1969 barely getting in the uh, tenure within this decade that Kennedy said we will land a man on the moon and safely bring him back. Um, so rather than July 4th, they came down on July 1st for, for Hurricane 1. And you see, um, as you might expect, a jumble of rocks uh, washed out uh, into this plane. The Viking landers actually didn't do uh, much uh, elemental analysis of rocks. We'll talk about what they did sample. Um, but basically, we assume, I can assume that many of these are, are igneous volcanic rocks that are jumbled up into that area, and then there's a lot of sand and other um, fine material. Uh, Viking 2 came down uh, a little bit later uh, in Utopia Planitia, much further north, away from the uh, equator, compared to the Viking 1 lander, but very similar. These are pretty boring sites. First time you land on Mars, why do you pick a boring site? You spent all this money to, to build these landers. Why pick a boring site to land on Mars? Why not land on the side of Mount Olympus? Because that'd be much more interesting. Why not land in Valles Marineris? Yeah, you're being too scientific here. It's like less of a risk. Too. It's safer, okay? Scientists always want to go to more and more interesting places. The engineers who have built these craft are always very protective and saying, uh, no, we're, we're not sure we're, we have the capability to put you down there in the middle of Hellas Basin uh, without uh, uh, you know, hitting the side of the basin wall and, and crashing. Okay, so here's the Pathfinder site. Um, doesn't look all that different from Viking 1 lander site. Uh, maybe even rockier. Um, but in this case, we actually had a rover that would, could, could go around and actually sample the rocks. And indeed, most of these rocks are basaltic, volcanic uh, fragments, uh, all jumbled up, essentially... Um, you know, wash down from further upstream. 
So I guess one point I'm trying to make here with these images is that it's, as a rule, igneous rocks are important uh, component of what's going on on Mars. Okay? It's a lot of, you know, you've had billions of years for lava to flow out of volcanoes, to build up layers and layers of igneous rock. There's not a lot of weathering, although there's some, and there's not a lot of plate tectonics that would create metamorphic rocks. So much of what we see is uh, going to be these uh, igneous rock fields. Uh, Spirit rover was directed toward Gusev Crater, and we'll talk more about this later, but the reason for selecting Gusev Crater was that they thought that uh, in the past, Gusev Crater was filled up with a lake. So what kind of rocks would you expect to find uh, accumulating on the bottom of a lake? Sedimentary rock. Okay, you have an option here to get sediments washed in, compactified, uh, cemented together to form sedimentary rocks. And so they sent Spirit here specifically to try to find sedimentary rocks that might have, you know, eureka fossil evidence in them or at least, a, 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 you know, some record of what conditions were like when those rocks were laid down. But when they got here, uh, the whole basin had been covered over by lava flows long after the sediments would have been deposited by uh, in that sedimentary, in, in that lake bottom. So that was a bit of a disappointment. Um, so instead they sent the rover on a trip that they didn't know whether or not it would survive. Um, the rover was only meant to last 90 sols, a little over 90 days, and uh, you know, it took uh, several years, but eventually uh, Spirit explored these uh, Columbia Hills, and we'll talk about that more later, but um, you know, finally was able to get out of this volcanic plain and see some more interesting rocks. Okay, Opportunity Rover. Uh, landed in uh, a crater in Meridiani Planum, uh, this Eagle Crater site, and you know had basically immediate success finding um, bedrock that were were basically sediments, um, layers of sedimentary rock in place in this bedrock uh, exposed in this impact crater. Okay. So there is you know, some ability for sedimentary rocks to be formed on Mars. Here's later in the, uh, the mission. You can see um, all of these sandstone uh, layers um, and uh, other uh, sedimentary deposits that were laid down here. Why, well, you know, what is our interest in finding sedimentary rocks? Igneous rock lets us know that there's been some kind of volcanic activity or other, you know, solidification of magma. Igneous rock is very useful because we can use, at least on Earth, radioactive decay to tell exactly how long ago that igneous rock was formed. Why are we interested in sedimentary rock? There might be fossils. There might be fossils. Now, we're a long way from looking for fossils in sedimentary rocks on Mars, but, um, you know, if we are, we're going to go for a, on a fossil hunt on Mars, we would want to do that in sedimentary rock. Uh, yeah, this is... Uh, Spirit has been going so long on Mars, 12 years now, for a 90-day mission, uh, that it is uh, exploring all sorts of other areas that were never really dreamed of when the mission was sent to Meridiani Planum. This Endeavor Crater, um, we'll talk about what, what opportunities finding in Meridiani Planum versus Endeavor Crater when we talk about the history of water uh, on Mars and climate change. It's just a, 
<clears throat> another view. Um, you know, Opportunity's been roving around so long on Mars, it's actually been able to get to some more interesting places. Um, Curiosity rover is uh, the main part of the mission is to explore this uh, Mount Sharp uh, feature, which is in, in the middle of uh, Gale Crater. And uh, again, we'll talk more about this later, but this is essentially another important sedimentary rock uh, site. And other than looking for fossils, the other main reason why we're interested in sedimentary rock is that they represent or they record uh, what the environmental conditions were like when they were laid down. And so we'll talk about this in more detail, but Curiosity is uh, the main part of the mission will be to compare how the composition of these rocks change over time because that will allow us to really refine our story about how conditions on Mars changed over its uh, geological past. Okay. And I don't have any good examples of metamorphic rock deposits on Mars because, again, we're not clear whether they're actually the uh, processes that will um, take igneous rock or sedimentary rock and expose them to high enough pressure and temperature to actually change the, the composition of the rock. 